It's great to be back with you. Shell and I had a wonderful vacation. Uh, it was not restful. You do not go to D.C. or New York City to rest, I found out, all right? Uh, you go to walk, all right? Um, let's see here. We walked. We took a subway. We had a train experience. Uh, we took a taxi. And I am a veteran Uber customer now, all right? <laughs> I had never Ubered in my life until this trip, all right? And now it's on my, I got an app on my phone, wherever it is. Um, and so we, we, we've had all of those experiences. Um, I do not ever need to visit New York City again, all right? It was wonderful, glad I did it. I have no need to go back there unless somebody wants to take me back to a Yankee World Series game, all right? then I would have a reason to go back. Otherwise, I really don't need to see New York City again. It was wonderful, but um, I, I, we saw a Yankees game. Uh, we had cheesecake. Uh, we saw a Broadway musical. And uh, I had a really, really good pastrami sandwich. So what else is there to do? All right, we have done New York City. So uh, Washington, D.C. was, um, man, if you love history, uh, it was inspiring. It was... Uh, and I have to be cautious because it also, there were things we went to that were depressing. Uh, when you realize the deprivation of humanity, because those things do get highlighted. Those are key moments in history when you, you, you talk about the Civil War and you, you, you go through some of the things that are available for you to see there. And then, then, then you go to... Um, um, Oh, what was the one museum? I can't think of the word all of a sudden right now. The Holocaust, yeah. You do the Holocaust, and then you do the 911 memorials, both in D.C. as well as, uh, as in New York. You put all that into one trip. Um, you all of a sudden say, we're crappy people. Man, the wor and then Las Vegas happens, all right, while, while you're on the trip. And you say, how depraved can humanity become? And it makes us so grateful for what it is that God wants to do for us. He knows the depths of our depravity. He loves us in spite of it. And he says, I'd love to come rescue you from that so you don't end up there uh, in the same way. Um, I do want to take a moment before we talk about announcements or anything else. I do want to take just a moment for a pointed prayer for our neighboring state and, and the city of Las Vegas. Um, the, what a tragedy. Uh, the largest, you know, homegrown massacre act of terrorism uh, that there's been. Um, uh, we had some folks from our church who were there at the concert. Um, I'll tell your name as soon as it comes to me. She was in the last service. Katie, thank you. Katie Froman uh, was there. And uh, we're, we're so grateful was not injured. Uh, Tom Walters from our church, who's not here today, he's out of town this weekend. His grandson's girlfriend was there. And not only there, she was shot. Uh, she spent six days in uh, ICU in Las Vegas. Uh, was just released yesterday. Has to stay another day or two uh, just for follow-up before she can come back home. Um, and so uh, we had one of our local fireman's wife was there. Um, I married him actually years ago. And uh, she was there. And uh, being connected, her dad was law enforcement, retired in Clovis. Her, her, her husband is uh, a fireman. Uh, when things started happening and she ran to the street, uh, there was a taxi right there. And she just jumped in and said, take me to the airport. And she flew back to town. They had to go back four days later to get the stuff she had left in the hotel room. But she just, just got out of there. So what a horrible tragedy. Uh, it impacts uh, one of the men in our 8 o'clock service. Um, his uh, granddaughter is a nurse in Las Vegas. And uh, she worked 48 hours straight, all right, just because of the added um, pressure of all that took place there. Uh, Fawn's son is uh, in law enforcement there in Las Vegas, one of the detectives. So um, all hands on deck during this particular time. So, so many people are impacted. And, and then not only the victims, but I think of the family members of the one who perpetrated the whole thing. Uh, you have lots of chaos in their, wor their world as well. So I want to take just, just at the outset, just a pointed prayer for um, all those in that scenario, in that situation. Would you join me, please? My Father, I don't think I've ever been more grateful for freedom uh, than I am now. Um, 
the opportunities to visit the, the, the things that were hallmark moments in our nation's life, hallmark in that they were of extreme importance, not hallmark because they were warm, fuzzy things. But, Lord, just from the American Revolution for freedom and Civil War for freedom and um, the memorials to things like 911 and Auschwitz and to recognize the, the sacrifices that have been made over the battle for freedom. And then I can't help but think of the price paid at a place called Calvary's Hill, Golgotha's Mountain, where your son, the Lord Jesus, laid down his life as a ransom for my sin and for all sin. And Father, at the, at the problem of sin is destruction. And sin at its worst does things like we have read about and some in our community witnessed that took place in Las Vegas several days ago. Father, we pray for those who are, uh, are having to bury loved ones as a result of, of a senseless act of an individual. We pray for, for comfort in their grief. We pray for hope in their pain. We pray that members of your family will find them and follow your leadership and offer to them what you can provide. Father, we pray for those who work in so many different areas from the hospitality community to law enforcement, fire department, hospital staff. Uh, thank you so much for all of their quick responses. For those who just stepped up and came to the assistance of those who were injured and wounded and did things they didn't have to do because they showed the opposite character than the one who was in a hotel room. They showed neighborly love and compassion they showed heroism. So, Father, we just express to you our gratitude for them. However you can use us, even as far away as Clovis, I pray that we'll be responsive to your leadership. And we just trust you for the needs that, uh, that has been caused by this senseless act. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I'm going to kind of jump ahead to one prayer request that I usually share at the after announcements. But we've talked about a, a tragedy kind of on a national level in Las Vegas. While we were gone, there was also a tragedy locally, okay, within our own church family. Um, tragedies are defined in a variety of ways, but when, when unexpected painful things happen, uh, that's a tragedy. And um, uh, Lori Brigham from our church, part of our 8 o'clock service, been here for years. Uh, Lori has been one of those who has helped several in our church family through their times of tragedy. She is a, uh, an in-home caregiver, and she has others who work for her. And she has helped at least four, if not five, members of our congregation, some for days, others for weeks, and some for years. She has been their, their care provider. So she knows what it is to help them through physical disability, all the way through hospice, all the way to heaven. And um, never anticipated that the tragedy of death would occur in her family so rapidly. But her husband died while we were gone very unexpectedly. Not sick, not ill, uh, but died very, very unexpectedly. Um, services are being planned for some time in November. Uh, his children live in a variety of different states, and to get everybody here at the same time requires some um, planning and time to get it accomplished. Um, she was here at 8 o'clock service this morning, but just uh, want to take just a, a brief moment to pray for Lori from our own congregation, if you would. Uh, our, our Father, um, as, as tragedies happen on, on big scales, tragedies also happen on, on personal scale. And Lord, that's not to diminish the fact that a tragedy of a national level involves individual people. As, as we walk through the museum of 911, it's one thing to talk about it on a big scale. It's another thing when you look into faces of individuals and you see how this impacts families. Father, within our own church family, a tragedy occurred very unexpectedly, no preparation apart from eternal preparation with you. And so we just commit to you, Lori. Thank you for the strength that you've already exhibited in her over these, these last several days. 
and we trust you for the encouragement and the hope that she needs as, uh, as there's kind of a long period between, uh, between her husband's death and the closure of this in a service. And so however you can use any of us from her church family, I pray that you'll find us ready and willing to do so. We commit this to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me, uh, let me highlight some announcements and then we will engage in some other prayer requests today. Uh, don't forget we have Sunday night service uh, here this evening, uh, actually right over there in that building at six o'clock. Steve Brown, Steve wave over there. All right, well, Steve will be preaching tonight. All right, and uh, also we're gonna be sharing in communion tonight. All right, so uh, come as Mark leads us in that. We'd love to have you here from six to um, about 7.15. Harvest of Blessing tickets are available uh, in the pavilion. I understand the credit card machine is working today. I heard it did not work last week, but they've given me confirmation it is working today. And so if you haven't picked up your tickets, uh, it's at the end of the month. We need to get those tickets in as quickly as possible so we know uh, the numbers to turn in. So it'd be great. This is going to be just a wonderful evening of sharing. It's called the Harvest of Blessing for that particular reason. It is in fall time. It's harvest time. And it's a time for us to give uh, thanks and gratitude to God. God for what he's done here at New Hope over the last 25 years. And some of you say, Tim, I haven't been here that long. Uh, no, but because we were here, you're here now. And, and so we want to hear some of the stories. It's going to be a time of sharing. There's going to be some music. But mostly it's going to be a time of us sharing and just celebrating God's generosity and kindness to us for his last 25 years here at New Hope. Um, uh, there is the day that I least appreciate every year coming up next Sunday. And here to make that announcement is Fawn on the big screen. Good morning, New Hope. We have a special day around here next week. It's Pastor's Appreciation Day. Yay! This is a day we love every year. Now the pastors don't like it. It's not their favorite day, but we don't care. It's kind of like a funeral. You know how funerals are not really for the deceased person? They're really for those left behind that just want to say goodbye and celebrate their life. Well, this isn't really for them, it's for us because we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you to all of our pastors and for everything that they do for us. We want to say thank you to Tim and to Lonnie and to Mark and to Chris and Rich and Steve Brown as our Director of Care Ministries. And of course, Pastor Gill, so come prepared next week. We're going to have loads of fun. We're going to have a table out in the foyer. So you can, uh, if you have a gift or a card you want to leave them, or maybe some car keys or a timeshare in a tropical island, anything you want to do for them, we'll be out there and you, you're welcome to bring a gift and say thank you. We're going to have lots of fun. We're going to make them play a game. They have to play Saintly Millionaire. Uh, they're going to have a phone a friend. They're going to have a, a ask the audience. They're going to have a lightning round and the, the team that has the most accumulated point wins. So come on out and join us and let's see how knowledgeable our pastors really are. I came up with a new idea in the eight o'clock service. I think the way you ought to appreciate your pastors next year is don't have Pastor Appreciation Day. All right, I think that would just be absolutely awesome way to get, get, get away with that. Uh, yeah, I, I know, and it made me think, uh, are you guys planning my funeral by next Sunday? I mean, is that... <laughs> Uh, no, that's terrific, guys. They, uh, there'll be no 8 o'clock service next week, all right? Uh, the 8 o'clock folks know that, but if you happen to get up early next week and say, ah, I'm going to run to 8 o'clock service, don't, because <laughs> we won't be having it next week. Both the services are going to be, uh, going to be in here. Uh, Prime Timers Luncheon, in fact, uh, I don't know where the other board is, so uh, I'm going to send this one around. Um, if you're going to be attending Prime Timers Luncheon this week, they would love for you to sign up, because we have... Uh, there's going to be a concert afterwards, all right, some wonderful entertainment. The Gilly Girls, all right, uh, if you've never heard of them, trust me, you're going to love them, all right. It's a family of sisters. They're all uh, teenagers or younger, and uh, they are incredibly musicians and vocalists, and so it's going to be a fun time. So uh, if you've never been, you want to come to this, uh, they're just wanting to know kind of how many do I anticipate for the concert part that will be here inside the sanctuary after lunch over in the bridge building. Uh, please take note of some things that are going to be going on also next week, the No More Blues Closet, which is, uh, provides resources for inmates who have been released and need to get a head start in life. And so there are resources available at Prison Fellowship to help them. 
uh, Widow's Lunch Bunch will also be next Sunday afternoon. Uh, rehearsals for new kids, uh, I mean the musical for kids at Christmas time uh, is already taking place. Uh, and Christmas sign-ups, adult choir, I think we're also on that sign-up list. Uh, a few additional prayer requests uh, or praise items. Uh, Brandy Walker who has been back in Boston for her second time for a tumor behind her eye, uh, is home. Uh, she is doing well. Uh, one of her eyelids won't open. Uh, they hope that will come back in time. It had to be sewed shut while they did the work. But her other eye now has 2015 vision. And so very, very happy about that. And she seems to be doing very well. My barber of 40 years passed away just before we went on vacation. His service is going to be in about two weeks. Uh, Paul and his wife, uh, Claudia, attended church here uh, while Paul was able after he retired. Uh, he is not the singing barber, all right? He's not the Paul Williams who used to sing but he is the Paul Williams who used to cut my hair for almost 40 years. Uh, if it looks like yours, no thanks. For those of you who couldn't hear that, he offered to be my barber, all right? And, and I, I already have a beautiful barber um, hairdresser, whatever we call her right there, all right? Um, I've already talked about. Okay, uh, and then one I was just handed today, Velma Crowley, all right, who attended our church for years, uh, married, no longer able to attend our church now, uh, her husband Marvin. She married a year ago in March, a few months later. He was in the hospital where he stayed for quite a while. He battled cancer. He went home to recover, and once he got home, after a brief recovery, he had a seizure. Now he's in a nursing home in Clovis. Velma called and wanted her New Hope family to be praying for them. Velma um, used to play the accordion at some of our senior luncheons, all right, uh, in the past and was a regular here for a long time. She is a delightful lady. Shelly and I still get cards from her every now and then. She's very, very thoughtful. So please remember to pray for her. Would you join with me as we pray? And then we're going to have our offering and Tim and the worship team are going to come back and lead us in our worship. Uh, just a reminder, if you had your pledges to uh, 1040i program uh, project, those need to be in by the end of the month. And we don't have it over there, but we'll make sure it's there by the end of service. We have nine kids left, all right, uh, for sponsoring. Whether you want to do that individually, as a small group, as a couple of families, uh, this helps a, a young person out of the community of Neonan uh, finish their education. And so uh, that board will be back over here at the end of service. Would you join with me as we pray? <clears throat> Father, thank you for your availability to us at every moment of every day. Thank you that you are uh, never asleep, you are never tired, you are never distracted. Um, uh, Father, if you had a refrigerator in heaven, all of us would have our picture on your refrigerator door. That's how mindful that you are of us, and we say thank you for that today. I wished that we were as mindful of you as you are mindful of us. That's a, a growing proposition for each of us. Um, and I trust there's a desire in each of our hearts to grow in our mindfulness of who you are and your presence at work functionally in our lives. Father, we surrender the needs to you. There are so many needs that walk in these doors today that each of us brought. And I trust that we will we'll respond to your invitation to bring our burdens to you and leave them there to bring our weariness to you and find renewal, to bring our frustrations to you and find peace. Uh, Father, we live in a world filled with chaos, but in the midst of the chaos, you offer us peace. I did not find peace in New York City. I did not find peace in Washington, D.C. I really didn't even find peace in the communities of the Amish in Pennsylvania. I found peace when I remember you. I find peace when I trust you. I find peace when I talk to you. I find peace when I listen to you. Thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thanks. We commit this to you in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you to find the book of uh, Haggai. We're going to pick up in our series from where we left off. Chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses um, 8 and 9 in just a few minutes. <clears throat> terrific, Tim, worship team, thank you today. Just absolutely uh, terrific. Um, loved it. Uh, they had no way of knowing, and you'll find out more in a few minutes, uh, when they chose the songs. I love when God does this, and he does it very regularly around here. 
when uh, the music is perfect for the message, and today certainly is. For just a moment, I want to play uh, Name That Tune with you, okay? What I'm going to have them do uh, at the sound booth is going to show up on the screen here in just a moment. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of hints. Um, actually, I'm going to give you one hint. This is from 1965, okay? Uh, you're going to get a little bit of a YouTube video here. They're not going to sing any of the words. They're just going to give you the intro music, all right? And you'll see some faces. Uh, if you recognize the song, just belt it out, all right? The, the name of the song. You don't have to sing, all right? <laughs> but but uh, hit it, maestro. The animals, that's right, that's the group, the animals. What's the name of the song? It's my life, life and I'll do what I want to, all right? Um, Now, trust me, just about everybody in this room can sing better than the lead singer of the animals, okay? (laughs) Uh, Isn't it true? Oh, yeah, this guy, okay, back it up. Oh, it's too late now. I was going to say, I'll play you the opening line of this guy. He's horrible. All right, and, and I grew up in this era, but he was not very good. Had a couple of great songs, but his voice is horrible. Um, but the name of that song is actually the name of today's sermon. It's my life, and I'll do what I want. Here's the words to the song. It's a hard world to get a break in. All the good things have been taken. But girl, there are ways to make certain things pay. Though I'm dressed in these rags, I'll wear sable someday. I'm not sure he was a very good songwriter either. And here's the, here's the words to the chorus. Actually, before I go on, what is the most famous song the animals ever sang? House of the Rising Sun. Of the Rising Sun. Yeah, they were one-hit wonders. Um, here's the chorus of this song. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but baby... But baby, remember, it's my life, and I'll do what I want. It's my mind, and I'll think what I want. Sounds like the 60s, doesn't it? And the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, and the 2010s. You see, it's a philosophy that's been prevalent in our world almost since time began. Quite often we will hear individuals today espousing philosophies of unbridled personal freedom. A few examples. The way in our culture that we deal with unwanted pregnancies by both men and women with no regard to the wants or the needs of an unborn child. How about the drug culture? Oh, the 60s wish they were living today, don't they? I mean, they tried to expound that the suppressed harmlessness of marijuana claiming that to keep these drugs illegal is an infringement on their personal freedoms. And one of the biggest reasons, arguments they gave is, hey, we legalized alcohol. So that means we should keep legalizing other bad things? You see, we have this idea and this notion that if we make it legal, it makes it right. I hope all of you don't take advantage of all of your rights as citizens because of the laws we have. Because just because America says it's right doesn't mean God says it's right. We have in recent years experienced the growth of what I now am referring to as any and all sex culture. Any and all. See, the claim is that no one has the right to tell anybody that their sexual urges are sinful. It's their life, and they will do what they will. It's my mind. I will think what I want. We hear of those who support and endorse promiscuity as long as it's between consenting individuals. The claim, again, it's my life. I'll do what I want. What is disconcerting is is that we often hear these views not only in the world in which we live in, but we often hear them inside the context of Christendom, of church, of Christianity. 
Many believe that this is a new philosophy that's been creeping into the church over the last 50 years since the animal saying, it's my life and I'll do what I want. But I want you to know this has been going on long before the 60s. It's what the book of Haggai really is partly about. You see, the people in Haggai's day, just as a way as a little review, they had the privilege of freedom. They were returning after 70 years of captivity in a foreign country where they couldn't do what they wanted. And now, by God's grace and provision, he sent them back home and said, okay, here's your life, here's your city, here's your home, here's your business. And they took the freedom that God had given to them to a new degree of license and licentiousness. What you and I need to understand is that privilege given has responsibilities for the ongoing privilege of privilege. I often tell couples in premarital counseling, and some of them who are here will attest to that this is reality. I tell them there are three words that I think is important for parents to teach children at an, as early an age as possible. And the three words are trust, responsibility, and privilege. If we can begin to teach those words to our kids at the earliest possible age, I trust you naturally because you're my own child. If you will be responsible with that trust, then you will earn, you will earn the right to hear me say yes to far more privileges than I will say no to. But privilege is closely connected to that word responsibility. For the Jews in Haggai's day, for them it was a brand new life, a fresh start, a do-over after 70 years of frustration and failure. But with that privilege of freedom was the privileged responsibility of rebuilding their home city, rebuilding their personal home, rebuilding a temple. We often get our priorities confused in life. We work in our own homes. Shelly and I have been doing that since we just moved a few weeks ago, hanging pictures, rehanging pictures, <laughs> and rehanging pictures, <laughs> and putting the ones we've rehung three times in the closet because it just doesn't fit anywhere. <laughs> I'm in trouble this afternoon. <laughs> but we work in our own homes, we work on our own educations. We build up our own businesses. We try to improve the communities that we were a part of, and we live as if God's house will take care of itself. Or we almost live with an attitude, God, if you need a house, build it yourself. What you and I have often forgotten is that God's house is not built so that God has a place to live. God does not need a house to live in. Jesus didn't need a house to live in when he came as man. The scripture says, you remember what it said? He didn't even have a place to lay his head. He used a rock. Birds have nests. Jesus, the son of man, had no place. He didn't need a house. You see, God's design is so that his family has a place to thrive. That's the purpose of the church. It's a place for God's family with him to thrive. God's design is that he is at the center, the core of our lives. Again, this is not for his benefit. Do, this will be a shock. This is going to be a shock. Do you realize that God is not one bit better off since you became a Christian? Do, do, do you understand that? He's not any better. He, he's, he's pleased. He's thrilled. He's happy but he's not one bit better because you're a Christian. See, he doesn't need any of this, but what he does know is that if we will allow him to be the center of our lives, the core of our universe, not for his benefit, but for our best, when we have him in the right place in our lives, it's amazing how much better our life can be. Not, not tragedy-free, but in the midst of a troubled world, the best it possibly can be. 
these guys had no idea that I was going to talk about Jesus being the center of our lives today. And what was the middle song that we sang in worship? Jesus at the center. Here's how I know this to be true. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, you could turn there if you want to. I'm not going to be there long. But Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 3, uh, what some of you may know, the Bible scholars that you are, is Genesis chapter 3 is all about the fall. It's about Adam and Eve sinning, the first sin that ever entered the world. And as a result, all of us have become sinners. But we find a little fact in chapter 3 that we kind of just brush by. It's, it's found in verse 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, this is, this is Satan taking the form of a servant, tempting Eve in the garden to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. In the middle of this garden are two trees. One is the tree of life. The other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, at the center of our lives is a choice. Submission to God and his plan for our lives, which will lead to our best, or choosing to do our own thing and go our own way and experience the consequences of those choices. In the middle of the garden are these trees. The tree of life, that is God calling. <laughs> He's a chaplain, so I literally, it is God calling to send him out, all right? Um, so, so we have these two trees, and, and, and God had told them earlier in the day, you can eat all the fruit you want of the tree of, of life. Eat all you want. Don't touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, Tim, isn't knowledge good? Truth is, yes, and God told them the truth. They knew all they needed to know about good because they knew God. They didn't need to know about evil because evil has nothing to do with God. And yet they, they made a choice to go in a direction that was not God. You and I, at the core of our lives, have a sinner choice to make. Are we going to trust Jesus' leadership in our lives and do things his way, or are we going to go to the tree of the knowledge of not just that which is good, but that which is also not good? It's evil. It's not of him. And there will be consequences when we choose to go that direction. And there were from Adam and Eve. So Jesus at the center has been a part of humanity since creation. This is where God was designed to be. Um, the, the, I want you to throw the picture of the tabernacle up. You remember the children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness, all right? After a long period in captivity, God helped sent them free. I don't know if you can see that real well. Yeah, it's bigger up here than it is back there. Um, uh, God had a plan for the way in which they were to camp out. How many of you go camping? Okay, do you have a plan when you go camping? Okay, you just take, don't kind of show up and figure out what am I going to do now, right? You have a plan. You look for the place to put the tent. You look for the right place to do the cooking from. You look for the right place to sleep in, all right? Uh, you, you have a plan. God had a plan for the children of Israel as they traversed the wilderness on their way to the promised land. He wanted his life to be the center of their world. And so when they set up camp to stay in one location for a while, here's the way it was to look, all right? And let me just kind of highlight it. I've got it here. One of these days, I'll be able to poke my iPad, and it will show up up there, all right? Um, right now, we have to do it with, I need a lot of help, all right? Um, but here's what I want you to know. 12 tribes of Israel, right? God said, here's the way you're to set up camp. On the east side, it's to be Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. On the west side, it is to be Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. On the north side, it's to be Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. On the south side, it's to be Gad, Simeon, and Reuben. There's your, 12, there's your tribes, all right? Then, then 
Closer towards the hub is the tribe of Levi, the priests. Okay, and the priests were broken down into different, the tribe of Levi into different segments and groups. There were the, the Gershonites and the Merites and the Gehitites, all right? And, and they had different responsibilities in, in the tabernacle worship. And then at the east end in that inner court was Aaron and Moses and, and, and the priests. And then what do you find in the very center of their camp? It's the tabernacle. And the tabernacle in the Old Testament is the picture of the presence of God in their midst. And where was that presence of God to be? In the center of the camp. You see, this song that we just sang today, it's a, a, one of our newer worship songs. It's right on the money of God's truth. I, I was going to take you to the temple and where it's located, but <laughs> uh, I don't have enough time to cover that with you today. Because there, there's a big argument, all right, about where the temple was, where Solomon's temple originally was, where this temple that we're reading about from Haggai's day was, was built. Uh, they're still fighting over temple location today in Jerusalem. The Jews and the Muslims are fighting over a, a piece of ground because of where they think the temple originally was, and they want that spot of ground. And there's a whole pretty solid argument that it really wasn't even in Jerusalem. It was in the city of David, which was a suburb. <laughs> That's a whole other story. So let me jump past the temple and take you to the crucifixion. Where was it? It was at Golgotha, Calvary's Mountain. One of the highest areas there. Why? So that no matter where you were in that area, you could look up and you could see Jesus. The scripture says he will be lifted high. He was lifted high and crucified so all eyes could be riveted on him. We sing this new worship song written by Darlene Zeck. Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning creation to the end, his return, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Does this sound like your life? We sing it. But do we live it? Or, or do, we, do we get a little caught up like the people in Haggai's day? I'm getting there. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. Give careful thought to your ways. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It's time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled custom homes while my house remains in ruin. At the center of it all. Jesus, be the center of my life. It's always been, always will be about you. So the question, do we just sing it? Or do we really have a desire to live life like that? These Jews in Haggai's time had an opportunity to start fresh and new. They knew the history of the temple that they were going to rebuild King David wanted to build the Lord's house, but the time was not right for him, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. David's son Solomon would build the Lord's house, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Before David's death, though, David had the privilege of appointing the masons. He prepared the iron and the brass. He received the cedar trees as gifts from Lebanon. He had collected the gold and the silver and the timber and the stone, and all of it stood ready, and the workmen were appointed. For the worship that would take place once the temple was built, the tribe of Levi had been given their tasks by David. There were those who appointed, were appointed to assist the priests and work in God's house in the purification rites and worship, in the presentations of offering and attending to the needs of the temple and the priests. Musicians and singers, the first worship teams, they were appointed. So in the temple, as in the state, of Israel at that time, all was in order, and King David could die in peace. An acknowledgement of David's zeal, excitement, enthusiasm, and desire for this matter, God promised that he would build David a house of an everlasting dynasty. 
Solomon, of course, did build a temple. And it was magnificent. A few weeks ago, I talked about the billions of dollars in current cash it would take to try to replicate Solomon's temple today. And the presence of the Lord, once it was completed, so filled that temple that the priests could barely stand inside of it. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, it says, King Solomon declared, Behold, heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain the Lord. How much less this temple that I have built. Solomon said, Man, as big and as magnificent as this temple is, it doesn't compare to the presence of God that showed up today. Remember a few weeks ago, we had one of those Sundays where the presence of God palpitated in our midst. And it was like, wow, we couldn't contain ourselves. That's what Solomon said. As time went on, the people of Jerusalem forgot the Lord of the temple. And they became more concerned with the temple of the Lord. Don't miss that. So let me say that one more time. As time went on, Israel and the people of Jerusalem forgot the Lord of the temple and they were more concerned about the temple of the Lord. Say, so who's at the center of it all? They were rebuked by the prophets in Jeremiah chapter 7. The anger of the Lord was so great against his people for their failure to worship him, to put him at the center, that the people were then led into exile. That's what Habakkuk and Haggai are, are, are all about. The book of Haggai is about the people finally getting to come back home, to get a chance to rebuild, to get an opportunity to be refreshed and revived. In the process of renewal, there's always discouragement and setbacks. How many of you have ever gone to retreat and, 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 and had a mountaintop experience with God? Ever, ever happened to you? Yeah, yeah. Woo. And, and what happens on Monday when you get back? Immediately a setback. Always something comes up to snake bites to see, is, is, is this just an emotional experience or, or is this a genuine commitment and relationship to the Lord Jesus? When Israel was taken into captivity, their city was laid to waste. Their homes were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Seventy years after exile, the Jews were allowed to return home. A new line of prophets sought to lift up the sagging spirits of the workmen who had stopped working on God's house. And Haggai 2.9, notice what it says. Verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. What I'm going to do in this little house we're building is going to be far greater than what we did in the bigger house that Solomon built. And in this place, in this place that you think doesn't have great significance, I will grant peace. One of the last prophecies in the Old Testament it's found in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So the glory did return. You see, you can find it in Luke's gospel, chapter 2 and chapter 3, where Joseph and Mary took the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. What temple was that? This temple that they had stopped building. This temple that the prophets had to encourage to get back to the work and finish the task. It's to that temple they built in Haggai's day that Joseph and Mary brought the baby Jesus. You see, the greater glory is who? Jesus. Jesus never visited Solomon's temple. Jesus visited Haggai's temple. When Jesus was presented in the temple as a babe in the arms of his parents, Simeon, an old priest, took the child in his arms and he praised God and he said, it's time for me to die now. I've seen the glory of God in my arms. The Messiah has come. It's time for me to go. Here at last was the one who would be a light to a darkened world and the glory of his people Israel. The present of a presentation of a child at the temple was no uncommon occurrence, but this was no ordinary child, a fact recognized by both Simeon in his famous song and by the prophetess Anna who lived in the temple most of her life waiting for this divine moment. Jesus attended that temple again later, and it's recorded, and most of us know about it if we've studied the scriptures at all. You remember when Jesus was 12 years old, 
He was taken by his parents, Passover time, back to Jerusalem. And, and, and the parents got on the parade with other relatives and headed back home. And they got a half a day's journey away and realized, where's Jesus? It's horrible to lose Jesus. <laughs> and they'd lost him. And so they went back. And you know where they found him? They didn't find him in a playground. They didn't find him in a park. They didn't find him at Disneyland. They found him in the temple confounding the priests with his knowledge of the scriptures. Come back next Sunday on Pastor Appreciation Day and see if anybody confounds you with the knowledge of the scriptures. Trust me, it will not be like what Jesus did on that day. On another visit to the temple, Jesus, the meekest man who ever lived, he overturned the money changers' tables. He took a cord and he whipped them until he drove them out of the temple. You see, there is a fine line between gentleness and boldness. And Jesus did both well. On his way to Jerusalem on one occasion, Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob and she entered into a conversation with him. And she wanted to know where was the right place to worship. There was this ongoing argument between Jews and Samaritans where they were to worship God. And Jesus' reply must have surprised her when he said, those who worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about the exact location. It is about the truth and the presence of God in your life. Forty years after this conversation, the root Jerusalem temple was again destroyed, never to be rebuilt. There is no need to rebuild it because all that it stood for has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In those sacrifices of the early temple, it was a constant reminder of sins. Once a year, a high priest went into the most holy place with great seriousness and he sprinkled blood on the sacrifice before the presence of the Lord. But once Jesus came, he was made the one acceptable sacrifice on all of our behalf for all times. He's offered his own blood before the throne of the Lord. He has covered our sins and made us one with God so we no longer need a temple or an altar or sacrifice. It's all fulfilled in him. There's no reason for temples of sacrifice anymore or even to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem as Christ has finished the work of sacrifice. The glory of Christianity far outshines the glory of any temple, even the Lord's own temple in Jerusalem. In a sense, when God blessed David with a dynasty that reached all the way to Jesus, he has in the very act been building his own house. And you were part of it, and you were part of it, and you were part of it, and I am part of that dynasty of the promise that God made to David centuries ago. The Lord said to the Jews at the time of the building of this second temple, in this place, I will give peace. It has been through the preaching of the gospel, God's peace continues its journey from Golgotha's hill throughout the city of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth to this very day in 2017. Jesus has left a strong legacy to the church, not the temple, to the church. At the coming of the Holy Spirit, there was the gift of all that the corporate church would need for the worship of God. Some people say, I don't need church. You don't in order to be saved, but trust me, if you are saved, the church needs you. Because God has gifted every single one of you. You have a gift. When the Holy Spirit has come to live within you, he has given to you a gift that is to be used in the purpose of his church to accomplish the great commission, which it is the church's responsibility to carry out, to go from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world, sharing the peace of Jesus Christ. That is our job. You have a gift. So, Tim, I don't know what my gift is. How hard have you tried to find out? How hard have you really investigated the scripture and time and prayer and talked with those who have some spiritual maturity to discover your gift? It's not just the, the obvious gifts are preaching. The other obvious gifts are music. We see that on this. But you know what? There are also obvious gifts of hospitality, encouragement. I received an email. I think I shared it on a Sunday evening service not long ago from a lady who shared about coming here broken. And the first thing that happened was there was a, an older gentleman at the front door that just recognized something in her, and he embraced her. She said, a hug was what I needed more than anything else that day. That's a gift of encouragement, recognition. There's gifts. Of, for some reason, God blesses some people with multiple gifts. But everybody has one. I mean, I, I, I know with great humility, I have multiple gifts. 
I mean, I could sing and preach. So, you know, I, okay, maybe I have just one gift. All right, maybe it's just one. But you see, God has given to us his Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus at the center of our life, and he calls us together to the church, not because he needs it, but because it's for our best. The church and the entire household of God's people is being built upon the foundation of the truth of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone himself. Thus says the apostle Paul, we are a holy temple to the Lord, a dwelling place for God by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Individual for, for their part, individual Christians for their part are duty bound to find their place within God's church to share in the roles that he's faithfully given them without encroaching on the roles that do not belong to them. I should never, ever take Tim or Milo's job. I should never do that. And there's a few of y'all that should never try to take my job, all right? Just leave it all. God's called us all to different roles. Each must tap into their own gifts. For what purpose? For the glory of God, for the good of his people, and for the witness of those who stand outside the church looking in. The temple of the Holy Spirit is the people of God, both collectively and individually. And because the Holy Spirit is indwelling the individual as the church, we are sternly exhorted in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, and 20. I need to wrap this up, but I want to say this very quickly. In 1 Corinthians 6, 17 through 20, the scripture says that by the work of Jesus Christ, you and I individually have been brought into unity with Jesus Christ. And then it says, are you ready for this? Talking about unity, then it says, the next line, flee sexual immorality. How do you go from unity with Christ to fleeing sexual immorality? I suggest to you that God knows the human heart condition. And one of the quickest ways to get us messed up is in the matters of the flesh. And in the very next verse, he says, your bodies are the temple of the living God. It's no longer buildings made by human hands, even if they cost us billions of dollars. The temple of God today, where he chooses to reflect greater glory now than he did in Solomon's day, is in your body and mine. You may not like what I'm about to say, but it's the truth. What Paul is telling us here is, whenever you have sex, God's there. Think that through. God loves sex. He created it. He designed it. He designed it in a context of a marriage between a husband and a wife. In that context, it is as beautiful as it can be, and you don't have to be ashamed that God is in the room. Outside of that, flee sexual immorality. You didn't know that's where we were going to end this sermon today, did you? <laughs> you see, we have no way of technically knowing whether the second temple was considered in its time to be greater than Solomon's temple, though I suspect we could say, yeah, we know the answer to that. But we know that Jesus offered a more perfect sacrifice than any ever made at the temple. We know that the church has in him a more substantial foundation than the symbols of the Old Testament. The Lord has poured out his Holy Spirit on his people, making our hearts his temple. The shadows pass away for the reality of what Jesus has done for us. The spiritual replaces the temporary. All that the temple stood for in the past has been fulfilled in Christ. And when you and I get to heaven and we get to the new Jerusalem, guess what? There'll be no temple there, the Bible says. For the Lord God Almighty, the sacrificial lamb, will be at the center of it all. So here's the question. Which song best describes your life today? The animals, 
This is my life. I'll do with it what I want. Or Jesus, you are the center of it all. Which one best describes you? Nobody can make that decision but you. Maybe an even more important question is, which song do you want to describe your life? I find that the name of the group who sang the 60s song quite interesting. The Animals. It is Major Thomas who drove a point home to me one day, and I know I I was right on time in 8 o'clock service. But I need to wrap up with this. Major Thomas is the one who said to me, Tim, it is the presence of God in a man that makes us normal. Without the presence of God in a man, we are not functional. Because it takes God's presence in the one he created in his image to accomplish a purpose for which God has given to them. Animals have a rigid interlock called instincts that governs their behavior. A cow will always behave as a cow. A horse will always behave like a horse. A dog will always behave like a dog. Um, I know some of you think they're your children. They're not. Okay? I, I, I can't believe I'm ever going to say this. I love my cat Herndon. I really did not like cats. We rescued him again last night. All right, we left him in the country. He was not doing well. Without us, what we found out is it's not necessarily environment. It's relationships. I learned that from a cat. (laughs) Fascinating. But he said, Tim, a dog behaves like a dog. A cow behaves like a cow. But a man without God in his life will behave worse than an animal. It's my life. I'll do what I want. You will get what you don't want. Let's pray. Lord, I don't know if I should go on vacation again or not. (laughs) But what I do know is I really do want my life to reflect more of the song that Jesus is at the core, the center of the decisions I make about relationship. If, Lord, if I was 15 today, knowing what I know now at 60-something, I would want you to be the center of my life. It would change some of the decisions that I made. But Father, it's never too late to make the best decision in our life, to let you be the center of my life. It may change the way in which I choose to run my business. It will certainly change the way in which I spend my finances. It will certainly change the way in which I treat my enemies. It will certainly change the glory of your presence in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.